Greetings everyone, Fro here. Welcome to the Demo Hub. Welcome to another exciting episode. Today we have two fascinating guests, Paul Dudley, the co-founder and CEO of StreamCap, and Ricky Thomas, who is the CTO and co-founder of StreamCap. Thanks so much, Fro. Yeah, I really appreciate you having us on and yeah, excited to share what we've been building at StreamCap. That's awesome. Before we jump in, where are you both calling from? Yeah, we're dialing from what is at becoming sunny London. <laughs> it was cloudy this morning, but in the spirit of being ever changeable, the sun is now coming through my window. So, you know, you never know what to expect here. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So Rick and Paul, really excited to hear about what you're working on by name of StreamCap. Can you unpack that for the audience who've never heard about StreamCap and the name StreamCap even, I'm very fascinated about what that name means. Take it as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. So we're a streamy change data capture platform, software as a service. So we make it really easy to, you know, to start streaming data from you know, your favorite databases into Snowflake or BigQuery. Yeah, a bit of the origin of the name is, well, stream is hopefully a pretty self-evident. It's streaming. And then, you know, if you're familiar with Kappa architecture, so a streaming first architecture is where we, we took the cap from. So yeah, a bit of the origin of the name. Yep, that's very exciting. I know we have a demo here planned, but before we jump into the demo, what is the motivation for streaming? Why is it such a fascinating thing that companies should be thinking about at this point within the modern data stack? Yeah. So I mean, Ricky and I have worked together in a couple of data companies, including a, a batch processing based ETL tool. And one of the patterns we started seeing increasingly over the past few years was, you know, the companies were looking to provide more real-time experiences for their customers, but that was sometimes complex to get up and going, right? There's powerful tools that exist out there like like Kafka and then there's an ecosystem that sits around that. But often that means, you know, sort of fairly serious development time and DevOps effort associated with getting that stuff up and going. And when we talk to folks often months to get things live in production level pipelines. And so, you know, we felt like there was a real opportunity to make that process a lot easier and, and you know, go from sort of month to minute. And I guess in terms of like the ultimate inspiration, why companies were able to do that was, was often sort of customer facing elements. I think something that probably we're all familiar with as consumers is something like Uber Eats, right? And being able to see on the app where your order is. And actually there's also the equivalent experience for the riders or drivers to show what their orders are and actually for restaurants as well. So there's a lot of real time stuff powering things that we, we see every day. And that's true across e-commerce, retail and hospitality point of sale and manufacturing and anyway, we can go deeper on some of these cases, but those are the sort of things that we see driving this sort of push towards real time streaming. No, okay. That's really good. Do I concur that there is definitely value in the low latency real time and we all experience it using technologies today, but what is the alternative that the industry has faced? You mentioned Kafka. Why is Kafka not enough or is your solution built on a pipeline like Kafka? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Kafka is, is great. We actually use Kafka and Kafka compatible systems under the hood. But, you know, in terms of the time to value, I like there's a lot of room to improve. So when we talk to customers who had deployed Kafka, as I mentioned, it could be months to get to a production grade deployment, whether that's in a specific space we're focused on today, where we're looking at database replication and sending data into analytical databases like Snowflake, that there was a lot of custom work that people ended up doing on connectors and, and quite a lot of DevOps type work to make sure that your connect to your pipeline scaled and were reliable and things like that, that, that ultimately led us to feel like there was a real opportunity to provide folks a simpler experience along those lines. All right. So you're leveraging Kafka on the need for some of the queuing and the messaging part of things in terms of the source, and again, just to orient the audience around what's available and the value you add, there is like the DB zone for capturing changes. Are you building on that or do you have your own framework built from the ground up? Yeah, so we're building on the BZM and you're know, building on top of that in some cases to make sure that we're able to capture, you know, the change data capture streams from different databases that folks are looking for. So MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB are kind of the most common requests, but also Support for Oracle and SQL Server and others. All right. Really fascinating space is something that everybody loves to have yet the data in real time and businesses are hungry and asking for that. But let's jump into the demo. I know Ricky is really excited to jump into that, that demo to show us how to get set up and what the UI and the interface of StreamCab looks like. Take it away, Ricky. 
which I was thinking. So what we've got here is a SaaS app. So available online, but currently hosted within it. We are looking at potential on-prem solutions too. Ultimately, if we look at the sort of the app here, we've got three sort of key pages and concepts. Not particularly dissimilar to Batch ETL, but of course we only focus on streaming. So we've got a source, so this is data we're going to take data from using change data capture. We've got a destination, the data we're going to insert data into. In this case, we're inserting data into Snowflake using their new feature, Snowpipe Streaming. That's using a Kafka insert in effect for some second inserts. And then we have the concept of a pipeline, which is connecting the source to the destination. We could skip the pipeline. We don't need that necessary logical connection, but what we'll see is with streaming is that people are thinking about streaming data once, read once, and streaming out to multiple destinations. So that's what, that's why we have this connection. Here. Is the concept on the pipeline to do future transformation as the stream comes true? So at the moment we're doing source to destination, reading the CDC log, and we're not, apart from with the nuances, we have to sort of check the data, clean up some obvious issues. We're not doing stream processing, but we're releasing that in April. And then you'll be able to carry out any sort of transform, filter, you know, aggregation accordingly. And customers are asking for that, of course, not just to strip out things like the AI data, but to create separate, so for example, aggregate stores. So holding their data in Snowflake, but maybe a separate aggregate store in another real-time database as well. So yeah, so we've got that coming in, coming in April. Okay. So if we just take a look, first of all, to look at the sources we currently support. So as you can see here, we've got Mongo, DocumentDB, MySQL, Postgres, and SQL. We support all sort of flavors of this. So it could be Aurora on RDS, for example. We support on-prem as well as cloud-based. And, and we support the on-prem side or the connections that we support will be from SSH tunnels, a private link, these sort of things. And then on the destination front, yeah, just to double click on, on the source side, I see there is SQL Server, there's your typical RDBMSs. What about like Oracle or even connectors that are not yet? Do you have a way for folks to introduce that into your development pipeline? Yeah, it's exactly. We get quite a lot of requests. So Oracle is actually in our pipeline already and should be added in the next few weeks. And then we've had requests for, well, we haven't looked at destinations, but we've got lots of requests for real-time databases. We've got requests for, you know, concepts such as Elasticsearch and, and other sources that are just, you know, quite obvious to, to add. That'd be, and, and the way to get that in our pipeline, again, for us to build, it is just have a chat with us. We can build new connectors usually within a week, but let's just assume two to three weeks for, you know, for decent testing. And so, yeah, so these are the more common ones. Oracle has been requested and on the destination point, if you are just show you what we've got. So we've got BigQuery, Databricks, S3, Snowflake and Starburst. And we've had, as I say, a request for sort of click house, rock set, Elasticsearch, and so on. As we've looked at the source, in this scenario, we'll, we'll do a simple test of just showing some streaming data. And this source here, we've got a latency of zero at the second. Yeah, so there's no new data coming through, which we'll push through. And so on latency, I would have said that's true real time, right? You always have <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. I could just hard code it for the demo. So, and then we've got a couple of tables, very low values in it at the moment, and we'll just start pushing data in, showing it go through. So it's got a couple of tables or what, you know, in the streaming world, they're called topic. But in this scenario, it, it's the same, it's interchangeable for us. And, and this is just sort of status that's the, as to how it's going. Um, and we can. I apologize. The topic in this case maps to a table then that is. It does in this case. Yes. In streaming world, it might not do. It could be an event from a, a web event, for example, or, you know, any other type of event. But when we think about the, you know, the work that we're doing at the moment on CDC coming from databases, then, you know, it, it will relate to a table. Okay. But you're keeping that generic because you might expand beyond just reading from databases that have the construct of the table. We're keeping it kind of generic like that, but so you will see here, we've got tables. We are using them interchangeable at the moment, probably not the best thing, but we, we will be expanding beyond just CDC, but at the moment, CDC is up to your focus and, uh, and then adding, you know, stream processing, multi-destination and other, and other features to it. Okay. So, and then here, as I said, you could edit the table, add new tables, remove table and so on. As part of doing that, just to, to touch upon that quickly, when we create a new, let's say when we add a new table, we will start streaming from the moment we've connected So today's data going forward. And we'll also carry out a sort of snapshot or a backfill 
on the data that will be done incrementally. So from today's date, we'll then start loading up historical data as well as streaming board. And it will do that in small chunks, working its way backwards. So you're not sort of waiting for an initial snapshot under a table lock and so on. And it will, you know, it will work its way through the data so you can start using it straight away. Okay. And then because you're doing, again, just CDC, would you guarantee things like one semantics and, and all that as part of the delivery? Like we're not guaranteeing exactly once at the moment. As Paul kind of mentioned, under the hood, we've got a, a number of technologies. And so at least once is, is where we are. We're finding that following for our customers at the moment. And we're exploring different versions and modes available. Okay. All right. And then if we go back to your destinations, we yeah. saw the list of destinations that you had. Yeah. There was your typical destinations, the data warehouses. Does it make a difference with the delivery to the data warehouse versus a, a data lake type situations in this? Well, what we're trying to do is remove the complexity of all of this. No, it's definitely, it's definitely not that difficult to get started with the likes of Debezium and so on, but you, you might find that the sources are very well supported, but the destinations are not so much. Or it could be Schema Evolution support, and you know, a, 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 there's lots of different variables. So when it comes to stream, whether you're inserting to Snowflake, the process is the same. If I go here, I'm going to insert my credentials, you know, and so on. And if I go to a new Snowflake connection, it's asking for credentials. You see what I mean? So, so actually, you know, what we're remo- what we're doing here is kind of providing that sort of serverless environment so the user doesn't have to worry about it. So, so as long as you authenticate the source, authenticate the desk, and put in some, you know, put in some variables like the right permissions or the right parameter, then at that point, StreamCap will just take care of streaming that data. And what we're trying to do is build, you know, fault tolerant, highly available, highly performant pipelines just out of the box that people don't need to think about when having the infrastructure, the support engineers, the monitoring, all these other things that, you know, are obviously critical for production systems. Yeah. And then you also echo that the data flows today you deploy on AWS. I'm guessing that's your own infrastructure for more sensitive clients or customers, maybe in the healthcare space or fintech or some of the more sensitive spaces. Do you have that option for deploying this into, say, a VPC where that data is all routed? Yeah, so not at the moment. So what we've seen, SSH tunnels are extremely popular. People tend to be just asking for that, actually, as they come to us. Not, we haven't actually had many people asking for on-prem, even though it's clearly useful and important. I think partly because they're coming from a kind of more batch ETL world. There's obviously some very popular, very good vendors out there and i think the default approach is to do an ssh tunnel so we've had that and we need to we haven't actually got support for that in the app at the moment but we will have in the next few weeks time so we've been setting those up for people as they come in as our customers come in we support aws private link as well that's been pretty popular it keeps it much more secure and cheaper in terms of egress traffic and so those those have been fine we could support on-prem in effect also but we as in soon but we think it'll be a few months all right and then can you touch on the scale and i, I thought you echoed on that a little bit how does this scale to from your small SMBs to your mega large corporations that are doing, you know, 10x, 100x, uh, well, yeah. do you have that elasticity? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, for today's demo, there's no point in me trying to stream a billion records. You know, I'll stream a handful of records or, you know, we'll try and get hush by thousand and see the, you know, and see the update come through, for example. So that would be a small, you know, that's too small a customer. That's not streaming, right? But, but small customers can come in as, and as long as it's priced okay for them, then the app, you know, copes fine. On, on the, on the larger side, we've already got customers streaming billions of records without issue at all. And, and that's where up until now our focus has been is just making very, very stable, scalable full torrent like fine. And if they think if we're lacking anywhere, it's the UX and we're, we're rapidly working on that now to, to bring it to life as well. That's awesome. And then you also touch on the pricing. Can you double click on that a little bit? Is this per seat, per volume? How is that? How are you owning this for the audience that might be looking at? Yeah, it's, it's based on data volume. So try to keep it pretty simple. D- data volume into the system. It's essentially a dollar gigabyte if you're signing up on the, on the sort of monthly plan. And, and then, you know, there's scale options for sort of larger enterprise customers. Okay. That's really awesome. So by the volume, which is very common. And, and then also more for Ricky in terms of, there's always a happy path that things will go right. And you know, your messages are delivered. What about error handling and, and when things don't go well, I'm sure you're definitely thinking about, about that. How are you looking at approaching that for the yeah. happy? 
Yeah, and it's obviously super important. Actually, one of the biggest issues we see people having is the kind of monitoring and, you know, of a Kafka setup. Now, once it runs, it's actually pretty stable. I think anyone who's deployed Kafka will probably vouch for that. But, but you know, lots of things can and do go wrong, especially when we first started this company, just sort of seeing weird nuances in the data or disconnects and, and so on. So we think we've taken care of as much as we can. And so this just works. But of course, it will fail at some point, And we haven't really had any major failures at the moment, but in terms of stream cap, but we have had disconnects from, let's say, a, a source or a destination. And, and actually that is probably the biggest concern for people is, well, what happens if you lose the, the streaming log, you know, there's been a disconnect and I'm not sure why that's such a big concern. It sounds like people have just tried it or had issues before, but there's a retention setting as well. And if we get a disconnect from AWS or sorry, not from AWS, but from a source or a destination. As soon, the split second that's reconnected will be streaming data back in as well. And we have sufficient protection you know, set up in our infrastructure to, to make sure we don't lose the log, people call it, so that we don't lose our, you know, our last offset position from when we were, were streaming it. Outside of that, we have sufficient in, you know, internal alerting that alerts us to every single issue or any issue the moment it happens. We're about to add further detailed logs page into the app. That's coming end of this week, early next week. And then in the next few weeks, we'll also be adding whole array of notification plugins, which will be, you know, go way beyond a Slack notification, which, you know, you might not be looking at Slack. So there'll be email, Slack, Teams, text messages, integrations to pager duty, these sort of things. So that a few people peace of mind that not only are we looking at it and, you know, and giving our sort of four nines SLA, we, you know, customers can make sure they get proper alerted in their alerting infrastructure. All right. Really, that's really awesome. And in terms of thinking of the modern data stack, are you integrating with well, you can lineage tools? I think DBT is kind of having some of that where you can, as folks are building this pipeline, see where your data came from, because this is, you're actually at the source of it. And as you're building that yeah. finish, how are you plugging into like the data catalogs of the world and, and what do you have around it? Yeah. So at the moment we haven't got any integrations. We think about it quite a lot. We're also interested to see where the other vendors are going with this. We've been speaking to DBT just recently asking or their plans for working with streaming companies. So I'd say there's no, I'd say there's no firm roadmap at the moment, but, but it's on, you know, it's on our, it's on our minds to be looking at some post April, but we're, we're, we're definitely looking around to sort of understand a bit more how people want to, how to, how they want to run their streaming pipelines. Yeah, I could do it. I'd say, I'd say it's because the modern data set, you know, it's very, I wouldn't say close knit, but it might be. <laughs> It might be, but there's, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the ETL data warehouse. So there's data warehouse, there's the fact ETL tools and the DBT, right? And there's, there's obviously then observation tool on, but you know, when it comes to streaming, it's all completely different. And a lot of people want to do their transformations in the stream and not necessarily within the database, but for obvious reasons, you know, there might be lots of advantages to that, but that's a big shift from where we've been going the last few years. So we've got some ideas, we've got some thoughts on it, but I think we're spending a lot of time trying to understand where the market thinks it's going to go. You know, it's the best bit to have Okay, really, really cool. And I can tell you the simplicity of it, having been in this space, my background was data integration, spent many years in that. So this has a, a special place in my heart when I see of tools really coming up in, in this space. One thing I want to get your thoughts for both of you would be around around the community. Uh, you, you definitely are leveraging the, the Kafka's and the DBZoom. Those are on the open source side. How are you partaking open sourcing or co contributing some of this, maybe on the connectors that you're building or the values you yeah. add to the community. Can you touch a little bit about? Yeah, sure. I and mean, it's quite interesting, right? Because we, we, we're working on technologies that we've, you know, let's say lifted and, and, you know, obviously the, the right view there is we should contribute back and you know, we, we, we want to contribute back at the right times and we, we're starting to do that. So for example, we've been helping with Snowflake streaming as a connector. So we've been working with their engineers. We've been pushing changes for them. We were helping them test each release as it came out of private preview. And we were finding new issues. Even when they pulled it out of private preview, we found two new issues. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't ready for production. So, so we've been contributing there. On the Debezium side, um, the, the particular area we think we, we should contribute or we've been discussing contribution is around signaling. So you might not know about this, but it's, it's relevant to Debezium. It's how you trigger kind of ad hoc snapshots. So we've been thinking about contributing there to make that simpler. And then also we've been thinking about adding SSH tunnel support into the connectors as well. We've heard from them themselves that they do want that feature. We're, you know, we're currently in the process of building it. So we think about giving that back. 
So I think we, we want to contribute back and, and we are, but I think there's more we could do for sure. That's, that's awesome. And talk about Slack and what I tend to see these days is folks are not just building tools or products, they're actually building communities, right? So Slack channels and GitHub repos. Do, do you have any of those that you want to call out? Because we're going to leave links in the description below for folks that maybe want to reach out. Not at the moment. I think, I mean, I guess my take on the Slack is that I'm not sure that we need yet more at this point. <laughs> there are some great, like, there are some great communities out there, which, you know, we're, we're, but I think primarily, like, if you want to you know, interact with us, yeah, we're, we're on Twitter and LinkedIn, but I, I think we felt like, you know, the data world didn't necessarily need yet another Slack at this point. That's, that's a fair enough pay. Now, I want to step back with bringing this all with a few higher level questions for both of you of leadership. What would you say is the biggest development or advances you've seen within the streaming space in the last few or so years as the modern data stack is really taking its own? And you can touch on developments as well as challenges that you're seeing that companies really are either missing the ball or should be thinking about. And feel free to pontificate, feel free to talk about what your future vision is as well. So I think the key thing is, is that streaming was unachievable unless you had a, a data team and a, or a larger infrastructure, if that makes sense. A lot of the, I was doing streaming 20 years ago on you know, more proprietary type systems like IBM and so on, but you know, we were doing this for gaming companies and actually, so streaming has been around a long time as people had streaming use cases, it might've been, it might've been tied more to financial products and so on, but it, you know, it felt difficult, it felt expensive and you know, we've been working with batch ETL for, for a very long time. And some of the vendors out there have done just, you know, especially like I can did an amazing job with the API or work there. We know firsthand how difficult it is to support those. I think, but, you know, but, 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 but what that has meant is the streaming was, you know, fast, maybe not needed, but also expensive was the, I think was the traditional thought. I think the biggest change has been streaming is now fast, cheaper, or can be cheaper. I mean, we're definitely cheaper than most batch and, and there's more streaming use cases, right? And who doesn't want their data faster if it's, you know, available faster and cheaper. And I think, you know, there's not just apps like us, but there's more other apps as well coming along. And there's a massive surge of them just making streaming plenty accessible. So for me, I think I think I'm not sure I consider there's been huge innovation in streaming, as in, you know, brand new sort of features and so on. But the I think the environment is really accelerating very fast now. And people are starting to think, why are we doing you know, why are we pay a lot of money for slow batch ETL? So for me it's more a, a movement to being supported by the tech ecosystem to make it accessible. Yeah, I, mean, I think I would mostly agree with that 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 yeah, where it used to be, you know, confined to areas where you absolutely had to have it, you know, increasingly. I mean, I think there's a general agreement for folks that if there are no trade-offs, right, if it's not more complex or expensive, then you would always prefer real time, right? But, you know, the, the sort of traditional wisdom has been there are significant trade-offs and therefore, you know, you kind of, you don't need it. But now, you know, I think that so those barriers are starting to fall and, and you know, we're hoping to contribute to that as well, but basically that, you know, you actually can do, you know, streaming just as easily as you can batch and, you know, solve some meaningful problems for your end customers in doing so. Yeah, that's awesome. Very illuminating perspective there. Do you see this really playing out in some industry more so than other? I do have some thoughts based on experience, but I'm curious to hear from your perspective on the front line, is that appetite for streaming certain use cases or industries more so than other? Yeah, that's definitely, definitely true. I mean, we've seen you know, there's a lot of demands in, in sort of e-commerce. I mean, yeah, broadly, I would say digital native companies where, you know, there's you know, the opportunity to engage with customers, you know, on their website and things like that, or in apps and, and you know, cases where, you know, you want to be able to provide per personalization or recommendations and things like that in real time. But it also, you know, in financial services, obviously, traditionally, there's been a, a core of financial services that's operated in real time. And, and that, that continues to be the case. And again, increasing these cases there, but, uh, but also in manufacturing and logistics where you have IOT as a big source of data, we we've seen that as well. And, and, you know, somewhat less so like the traditional BI internal use cases where I think real time can meet every 15 minutes or something like that. But occasionally you also see that so a, a more, um, uh, firm near real time application, but yeah, it's mostly customer facing applications. And I should also said like yeah, in, in retail and hospitality, I think there's a, a lot of, you know, customer facing stuff there right at the point of sale where there's, there's interesting use cases as well. All right. Well, thank you. That's very, uh, very powerful. And I'm guessing you are GA yet and folks can check you out on the website and 
started using this. Can you talk about where you are or are you about to launch? Where is uh, the product within the... Yeah. So we've got customers using the product live in production today. And it's been a sort of a more limited release, but I think as of this video going live, you know, it'll be, you know, generally available and folks can sign up at the website at streamcap.com. Well, congrats on that. Really appreciate it to have people join here to showcase this. Kudos to both of you. And best of luck as you go on this journey with bringing StreamCap to life. Links to all of this will be left in the description below for those who want to check out StreamCap. I'll leave the links to Paul and to Ricky if you want to reach out and talk about your use case. We just pick your brains on streaming and a streaming ETL as a whole. So thank you both again for coming on board the demo. Thanks for it.